as a matter for all of us when we see a world of so many secessionist movements and forced secessions when there is plebiscite and division and many things are up for grabs and there are very few examples of peaceful non-disruptive disillusions, although they do exist. Uh, this is an important issue for us all to think about. So uh, Jonathan is going to come up and speak and then we'll have a conversation and take questions from the audience. But before Jonathan does, he's provided us with an Academy Award winning short film. Jonathan's film, please. And this is, I'm very jealous the Institute doesn't have this. This is cool. Let it roll. In September 2014, the people of Scotland will vote on whether to separate from the rest of the UK and become an independent country. With all the arguments for and against independence, there is one critical question that remains unanswered, and that is, what currency an independent Scotland might use? It might not seem the most exciting topic, but the question is so important because the notes and coins we have in our hands determines so much about how our country is run and how independent it actually is. To show why this is, all we need to do is look closely at the notes in the hands of people in the UK. In England and Wales, the £10 note used is this one. In Scotland, they use a £10 note like this one, or this one, or this one. Now, they all look different, but they all have the same value. How is that possible? Let's start with the £10 note in England and Wales. Here's the thing that gives the note its value. Bank of England. And the statement, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of. In this case. Option one, Scotland forms a formal currency union with the rest of the UK. 
In other words, the Westminster government agrees to allow the Holyrood government to keep using the pound, as it currently does at the moment. This means that all the money in Scotland continues to be backed up by the Bank of England and ultimately the Westminster government, which, if Scotland becomes an independent country, would be a foreign government with foreign taxpayers. So Scotland would have its interest rates set by the Bank of England, which would be owned and controlled by a foreign government. And Scotland's financial stability support would also be in the hands of the Bank of England and Westminster government. And that means that the Westminster government might be called upon to step in to avoid a repeat of... The Westminster government would have to make sure, however, that the Holyrood government could pay it back for any losses which might arise. And remember that this is a Scottish government that has just taken on a hefty amount of debt. So, as part of the deal, the Westminster government is likely to insist on restrictions on what the Scottish government can tax and spend. In the same way that the... Oh, we're just getting to the good part. to the UK for permission. Under this arrangement, Scotland still has no control over the interest rates. And if this were to happen, then the Bank of England and the Westminster government would not be obliged to step in. The losses from this could be very large for a newly independent country, especially one with high levels of debt. But at least Holyrood would not have the Westminster government tell it how much it can and cannot tax and spend. But this is no picnic as a country with lots of debt can be constrained by the people it borrows from. Which brings us to the third option. Scotland sets up a new currency all of its own. This new currency would be backed up by a new, fully functioning central bank for Scotland, backed by the Holyrood government, allowing Scotland to set its own interest rates. But it would have to be in charge of its own financial stability. And remember, this is a country that has just taken on a lot of debt. And the Scottish government will have control over what it spends in taxes. But of course, this is subject to how much it can borrow from people. This time, however, there is an added cost that each time Scots travel or trade across the border, they will have to change their currency. But at least, if for some reason things don't go according to plan, the government has other options, such as changing interest rates and allowing the exchange rate to move. So to recap, on the one hand, Scotland forms a formal currency union with the agreement of the rest of the UK. Crucially, it is not clear how Scotland and the rest of the UK could broker this agreement. Never has such an arrangement between two independent countries been successful over the long term. On the other hand, Scotland forms an informal currency union with the rest of the UK. Note that this is similar to what the Republic of Ireland did for much of the 20th century before it joined the Euro not a period of great economic success. Or on the other, other hand, Scotland forms its own brand new currency. But it is a newly indebted country that has to say, I promise to pay the bearer. And it wouldn't have 300 years of history to build that trust. No option has the <clears throat> upper hand, but these are the main options facing Scotland if it chooses independence. As we have shown, the choice of currency determines so much control over interest rates, financial stability support, and government spending. Which is the best combination that Scotland can afford is closely linked with how much debt Scotland would end up with at independence. Until we know how much debt Scotland would end up with, it isn't clear which option an independent Scotland should take or even could take. And so Scotland's choice of currency is the big money question that is still waiting for an answer. This video is produced by NISA with funding from the ESRC. Oh, by the way, yes, I'm American, and yes, I'm sorry about my accent. But the key thing is, you've got to understand, folks, that this video is from a neutral perspective. No, no. If you want to find out more, check out the NISA website. But first, let us know what you think. Here's the hashtag to use. Hashtag anywhere, hashtag good money to you. Um, well, anyway, let's hear it for the American accent. Uh, just, just one factual reminder for those of you who wondered why the euro was not an option for Scotland. Remember that the Scotland would have to, if accepted, would have to spend at least two years in the exchange rate mechanism before they could adopt the euro. So that was why that was not in there. There's obviously a lot more to this than the big money question. And there's a lot of...
who's calling which kettle black. If the Scottish aren't supposed to leave the UK, why shouldn't the UK stay in the EU or things like that? So now I'll turn it to Jonathan. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me here and for uh, the kind words of introduction. Uh, um, uh, I will try and be relatively brief since we had quite a lot of the, the macroeconomics of currency union already. But first, just a, uh, um, um, uh, a couple of words about why I thought these, these two topics would be of interest, uh, particularly to a, uh, a, a U.S. audience. Um, the U.S. has... Um, and the global economy have enough problems of their own without worrying about the paro somewhat parochial issues of the UK. So I rather suspected that people here have not yet fully woken up to, uh, after several hundred years of relative stability, just what a period of constitutional instability the UK is going through at the moment. Um, on, in September, Scotland will vote on whether to become independent. It has been conventional wisdom in Westminster, and I suspect hence um, in much of the rest of the world, uh, that the result was a foregone conclusion. Um, it is not conventional wisdom anymore. Um, the latest poll this weekend showed a majority of 53-47 uh, for Scotland to remain in the UK, um, and we've got uh, five months of campaigning left. Uh, moreover, uh, given the political developments in the UK, uh, there is every reason to think that things may become even closer. Um, my personal view, but it's not worth very much since I'm not a political scientist, um, is that in the end, Scotland will probably vote to stay in. Uh, but it's going to almost certainly going to be close, um, and the chances that Scotland will vote to leave um, are quite significant. Um, the second part of my talk uh, something which is probably a bit better known here, but again, I think it probably still hasn't fully uh, um, pushed its way up the agenda for people who look at the UK, is uh, the question of whether the UK will leave the European Union. Um, if you had asked me um, or almost anybody else concerned with the political economy uh, of the UK five years ago what the chances were that the UK might leave the European Union within a decade, I would have said um, between 2 and 5%. That is to say, not impossible, uh, not completely beyond the bounds of probability, but a pretty low uh, chance, a tail risk. Again, that is no longer the case. Um, if the current government is re-elected, uh, then the, there is an extremely high probability there will be a referendum uh, on British membership of the EU in the next parliament. Uh, the probability of that referendum voting for exit, again, I would say is less than 50%, but not much less than 50%. Equally, if the current government loses, uh, the chances that there will be a referendum are still quite significant, either within the in the next parliament or shortly thereafter. So the chances that the UK will, will leave the European Union within the next three to eight years are not 50%, but not below 20%, perhaps one in three. Um, again, given the profound impact that that will have on the UK, this is, this is something, the, the, the degree of instability in the UK's constitutional and hence economic arrangements is something that has certainly not been seen in my lifetime, and I would say not, not since the, certainly not since the, uh, since the Second World War. So these are pretty big issues for us or for anyone who's interested in, in the future of the UK. Um, and hence, I will start with, uh, with the, the, possibly the, the single most famous cartoon in British political history. This is the Low cartoon published in The Guardian um, just after the fall of France. Um, and uh, it represents a sort of patriotism uh, combined with insularity that still uh, remains in parts of the British political psyche. So, um, first of all, Scotland. Um, I will be brief about this because I think the video showed up, uh, showed the sort of basic macroeconomic arguments, and I showed it because I wanted to show the sort of work that we try and do at NISA in terms of translating some of these complicated macroeconomic arguments um, into uh, 
language and format which is accessible to the people who we hope will be influenced by it. The people who will have to actually vote on whether or not Scotland leaves the, uh, leaves the UK. Now, we're not trying to influence their vote one way or the other, but we do want, think that the public ought to be informed about some of these issues. Um, so this is work done by my colleagues Angus Armstrong, uh, who's got a Scottish name but is of mixed background, um, and Monique Bell, who is German and American, um, uh, at Nieser. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, um, there are proper um, academic research uh, published, uh, funded by the, the UK Economic and Social Research Council behind this. Um, but the, the fundamental issues here are really the interaction between um, the quite high levels of public debt, which an independent Scotland would, uh, would inevitably have, um, and the choice of, uh, of currency arrangements. Um, so um, these are on, on fairly generous assumptions. We uh, estimate that uh, Scotland would end up with uh, a public debt of at least, uh, uh, um, in gross terms, 80% of GDP. That's if they get a good deal uh, out of whatever the post-independence uh, uh, arrangements are, possibly including uh, an idea which Angus has, has suggested, which is that, we, that Scotland tries to manage the, the, prob the dual problems of a very large public debt and the volatility of its oil revenues by actually uh, accepting a lower than, uh, than, quote, fair, unquote, share of the oil uh, um, in return for a lower than fair share of the public debt. Um, since that would in some ways clearly be optimal for, from the risk point of view for, for an independent Scotland. But even so, even with that sort of deal, given the, uh, the decreasing uh, uh, oil revenues that, that, that Scot the, because of the depletion of the North Sea, Scotland will become independent um, with a pretty large uh, 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 public debt by the standards of, of small European countries. Um, and certainly... Uh, when you compare Scotland with the, uh, the analogy that the Scottish nationalists tend to make, which is, is Norway, um, uh, the, the analogy looks rather hollow when you consider that Norway, of course, um, because it's had uh, oil revenues roughly equal to that of the UK over the last 30 years, which a much smaller country and a more prudent macroeconomic framework more generally, Norway now has a sovereign wealth fund of about uh, 600 billion, I think, euro or so, uh, uh, and uh, a very low public debt indeed. That is a very, very different financial position for a small petrochemical producing country um, to one to Scotland, which will have a large public debt uh, and rapidly running down oil revenues. Um, so... Uh, we come to the, the two main possibilities. If, if Scotland does want to take the pound, as, as the video said, uh, it can either share the Bank of England uh, with, the, uh, with the rest of the UK, or it can unilaterally choose to dollarize or sterlingize in this case uh, um, and, and use the currency without sharing the central bank. Um, both of those options to us seem to have pretty large downsides. Um, and in particular, um, the, well, the currency union one is fairly obvious. The, the, the point is that you, you lose uh, um, control um, entirely of monetary policy. Um, you lose any seniorage revenues uh, from the use of the currency, and you simply have to take the currency, uh, the, 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 phys the, the monetary position is fixed. It has the upside, of course, that you can do within that constraint, the constraint that you don't have control over monetary policy, um, you can do whatever you want on fiscal policy as long as you can, uh, you can finance yourself on the markets. Um, but the, uh, uh, um, that is not currently the preferred option of the, uh, of the Scottish nationalists should they win the referendum. Um, their preferred option is to go for a, uh, a monetary union which they argue could be negotiated with, a, uh, with, uh, with the, the government of the rest of the UK. Um, now, the government of the rest of the UK, George Osborne, is coming here on Friday, and no doubt he'll say it again in some context or other, has stated very clearly, and all the other major parties in the UK have said the same thing, that this option is not on offer. Uh, now, whether this is one gigantic game of chicken or not is, is unclear, and again, uh, uh, I won't get into the politics too much. But from an economic perspective, 
uh, a Scotland rest of the UK currency union would be a very new and odd beast indeed. A currency union between a large country and a small uh, and a, a country about a tenth tenth the size. Um, uh, a country, a currency union where both of those constituent countries had quite large public debts um, in the context of uh, recent events in the rest of the, Euro in, in the European Union, uh, um, in particular in the Euro area, where we've seen uh, some of the disadvantages of going into a currency union without pretty clear uh, rules and plans for how you deal with the coordination of fiscal policy. Um, and it is, frankly, from a political economy point of view, quite difficult to see how you come up with fiscal policy rules that are actually credible and enforceable um, in a currency union, an asymmetric currency union of the sort that is being proposed by the, uh, the Scottish government. Um, now, uh, some of you may have seen an article in the Financial Times by Anton Moscatelli, who's the vice a very respected economist and the vice chancellor of Glasgow University, uh, the other day, in which he said that a Maastricht-style arrangement uh, uh, for the uh, um, uh, for fiscal rules in a currency union would be easily negotiable between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, with all respect to Anton, that does not seem to me to be a very credible position. Um, uh, so, uh, simply to, to conclude, um, if Scotland wants to keep the pound, it will cede control over monetary policy. If it wants, on top of that, to have a monetary union, it cedes control over fiscal policy. Um, given uh, the level of debt that an independent Scotland would have, um, that seems to be a position which it's unlikely to be credible to sell to financial markets. So I will move on now to the second part, um, which is the UK leaving the European Union. Um, and just a, a few words about some of the issues here. Uh, whether the UK leaves the European Union um, is obviously not just an economic issue, it's a political issue. Uh, there are a lot of issues around democracy, uh, the sovereignty of the UK Parliament versus the, uh, the, tree, the, the, the role, the, the responsibilities that member states of the European Union accept through their membership of the EU, um, and those uh, political issues which are present in most countries in the EU are, are probably more prominent in the, in the UK than anywhere else. Um, but economics will be central. And the interesting thing, I think, and this reflects the fact that, as I said a few years ago, none of us quote, serious economists thought that this was a realistic possibility, there's been almost no macroeconomic analysis of the impact of the UK leaving the EU uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, the last serious piece of work was done by NISA, uh, um, my predecessors, about 10 years ago, uh, but things have changed a lot. And in particular, the degree and the, the, the scope of integration, as well as the scale of integration between the UK and the EU, have changed quite a lot um, in, in the last uh, 15 years ago. Um, and I think the, the key thing that, that I would say as a, an economist here is that it's not, it, there is not going to be one single number or one single piece of cost-benefit analysis on what the UK looks like out of the, the European Union. There are multiple counterfactuals. We do not know whether the UK outside the EU would have arrangements that look like the current Swiss arrangements with the EU, the current Norwegian arrangements, the current Icelandic arrangements. Presumably, it would be some bits and pieces of all of those plus some completely new uh, arrangements which would be necessary. Um, but... Uh, given that there are, are multiple counterfactuals, there are also multiple issues. Um, the European Union is not just a tra free trade area. It's not even more just, not just a customs union. And it's not just a customs union with some elements of political coordination either. Um, the economic of the EU now extend over a multiple uh, uh, set of, of interrelated issues. Um, so... I'm simply here going to list effectively what I think the key issues would be for the UK and the key subjects in which we, we and others will be trying to analyze over the next three or four years as we head towards what very probably will be 
a referendum or some other form of decision-making process that, that leads or not to our exit from the EU. But from my point of view, the six key issues, in addition to trade, are regulation, um, and that applies to everything from health and safety in labor markets through to food labeling, through to lawnmowers, um, noise, the noise that lawnmowers can emit. All of these things are regulated by the European Union. All of these things determine the location and pattern of productions and trade within the European Union. Investment, we know of course that multinationals make investment decisions partly on the basis of their, their access to the EU market. What would be the impact of either EU exit or a prolonged period of uncertainty? Um, we don't know. Um, multinationals are ha are frequently talk about the negative impacts, but would that those actually materialize in practice? Um, labor mobility. This was not even mentioned as an issue uh, uh, for the UK uh, ten years ago when people talked about the the economic impacts of our our membership. Um, financial services. London is currently the UK the Europe's dominant financial center. Uh, it is. Likely that would continue should we leave, um, but what would be the rules and regulations under which we would continue to be able to have access to the EU single market and finance? We don't know that. Um, and finally, uh, the EU budget and the common agricultural policy. Um, one of the main advantages for the UK of leaving would be, uh, arguably, we would uh, no longer have to make the current quite significant financial contribution we make to the EU and we no longer be burdened by the uh, common agricultural policy, which is even worse than uh, US agricultural policy, possibly not quite as bad as Japan's, but uh, still pretty bad. Uh, but even that is not entirely clear. Um, Norway is obliged to some extent to finance the, the CAP as it, as it currently stands. Um, so. Uh, um, the, the, the range of issues uh, over which this matters uh, um, is, is quite unprecedented. This is not just about uh, the, simple, the relatively simple economics of joining or leaving a free trade area or a currency union. Uh, and just a few charts to illustrate this. It's frequently said in the UK debate that the EU doesn't matter nearly as much because it's a declining, it's declining in, in terms of its size in the world economy and its size in world trade. The future is China and India and so on. Well, there's clearly some force to that argument. But nonetheless, the expansion of the EU means that actually our share of goods trade has not gone down with the EU, has not gone down at all over the past 25 years. In fact, it went up in the early 90s and it's been pretty constant since then. Um, it is still by far our dominant trading partner, and that, there's no prospect that that will change anytime soon. Um, here is the analysis we did 10 years ago of the impact of leaving on investment, on various assumptions, uh, and in turn the impact on output. Um, so we see quite a potentially quite significant negative macroeconomic impacts from, from leaving the EU. That's a couple of percent of GDP over five years. Uh, resulting primarily from the impact on investment and hence on the impact on productivity since um, uh, production that's financed by FDI, certainly in, in countries that are not at the technological forefront, uh, as, uh, as we're not on everything, uh, tend to see some productivity gains. Um, and then finally, uh, this is a pretty dramatic chart showing the impact of labor and mobility in the EU over the last few years. This is the, uh, um, the share of the UK workforce uh, that was born elsewhere in the EU uh, was pretty flat at 2% up until the Poland and the other A8 countries joined in 2004. Since then, it's close to tripled, if you run that graph on a bit more, um, and it's still going up. Uh, labor mobility within the EU has had some pretty significant impacts on the, on the UK, and leaving would equally have some pretty significant impacts. So uh, I will conclude there. Um, there is obviously a huge amount of material there, uh, um, both on, on Scotland and on the EU. Um, I emphasize again um, that the, uh, 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 the Scottish work is very much work in progress that we're doing in the run-up to the referendum. Uh, um, we've done quite a lot already. We'll, we'll be publishing some more over the next few weeks. Um, the EU exit work, by, the, uh, by contrast, is something we're just at the very beginning of. Uh, I haven't tried to provide any analysis, um, merely to give an overview of the, the, the complexity and breadth of the issues that we, we and others 
we'll be looking at over the next five years. But as I say, if there's one message that I think it's worth going out, it's that the the that the the UK is not the beacon of stability it used to be. It's quite a, a an unstable and hence quite an exciting time to be doing this sort of political economy work. Thank you very much. Now the little light's on. Very good. I'm going to start with something specific and then move to something more general as we hope to get uh, technological progress through foreign investment in our infrastructure. Um, so you, you in particular have been involved in the debate over EU migration in, in the UK. And that, if anything, seems to be the issue that's stirring up the most emotion, the most sort of, in our terms, Tea Party-esque reaction. Can you tell us a little bit more than that chart does about what is the nature of the migration? Has Poland, Romanian, Polish, Romanian, and so on migration been a negative effect on wages? How does it compare in the UK to what you know about migration elsewhere? Give us a quick one through on the situation. Um, uh, okay, I mean, I think the, the, uh, uh, the, the way, the magnitude of the migration post in 2004 uh, uh, Poland and the Baltics uh, and a few other uh, uh, countries from the from what was formerly the Eastern Bloc joined the, the EU uh, we took the decision uh, to give immediate access to UK to the UK uh, labor market uh, which was not the case in, in particular Germany, but in most other countries. Sweden and Ireland did as well. And Ireland, in fact, saw even more uh, migrants coming. Um, and I think we did not anticipate the magnitude of the migration flows that, that ensued. It was a combination of, a, uh, r r uh, of a, a good time in the UK economy with... Um, a, the, a flexible labor market. And I think it was simply the fact, a lot of it was simply the fact that we in the UK did not realize how flexible our labor market was, how easy it was to hire people, uh, and how willing employers would be to hire people if you got this no, new supply of relatively motivated workers. Um, so the magnitudes were much greater than expected. But the flip side of that, of course, was that the flexibility meant that actually the economic effects, as far as we can tell from our standard research methods are pretty benign. There was been no measurable negative impact on employment for UK nationals. And while there clearly have been localized and sexual effects on wages, the average effects on wages and even the average effects on lower skilled workers have been possible. There probably is some, but it's been pretty small. Uh, so we've seen relatively benign effects from a labor market and wider macroeconomic point of view. Um, but really some pretty poisonous political effects. Uh, and that was a combination of, of people who just weren't, ex in either the government nor the population was expecting this magnitude of flows. And it's also notable that a lot of the, the new migrants went to places where migrants hadn't been before. Mm -hmm. uh, just following up on that for a second, in the, one of the, what I would consider poisonous political threads is this idea that you have lots of Eastern Europeans who came and went on the dole or when the economy turned down, went on welfare. What, what's the state of research on that? Well, I mean, you don't even need to do any research. That just got, we know from just the government's own basic administrative data that, that that's just not true. Uh, um, you know, immigrants, like immigrants to the US, are considerably less likely to be welfare dependent, especially the, the Eastern Europeans. They're mostly young. They come, to, come for wages. I mean, we do have a somewhat more generous welfare state. Uh, than Poland, say, but it's not that attractive, certainly not if you're young and single. They do do quite well out of the family benefit system because one of the things that the Gordon Brown and Tony Blair did do was increase the, the generosity of in-work family benefits, the equivalent of the EITC here. So one of the sort of side effects of young people 
coming to do relatively low paid work is that once they have kids, they end up doing quite well out of the benefit system. That's not why they come. They're not coming to sponge off the state, but they do end up doing quite well out of it. Um, turning now to Scotland, I mean, what, one of the things that was contrasting is you spoke about the complexity of the EU issues, whereas on the Scottish case, you seem to focus almost solely on the monetary issue. But obviously, there are real side issues there as well. Um, to a first approximation from the outside, and I realize this makes me sound very biased, but it's the reality. I look at the Scottish economy and I see declining oil revenues, very steep downward path, much higher average age and health needs in Scotland than the average person in the rest of the UK. And um, not terribly many growing sectors in Scotland. Is that a fair characterization or, or is the real side of Scotland have some virtues that Alex Salmon has up his sleeve that we don't know about? Um, well, let, let me try and put the at least part of the contrary case. Um, so uh, uh, over the, you know, the, the, one thing that is pretty clear is that since Scotland, since devolution in 1997, um, and since the Scottish government, since we, the Scottish Parliament was established and they acquired quite a degree of control over domestic policies like health and education and so on, you know, Scotland's done pretty well. It's outperformed the rest of the UK, and Scotland is no longer could be described as the poor relation. Scotland's GDP is pretty much ident per capita is pretty much identical to that of the UK's, um, which means, of course, that if you exclude Greater Greater London, mm -hmm. Scotland's doing a lot better than the north, east, and northwest of the UK, or indeed the southwest of the UK. So, and it has some, you know, it has strength in financial services now. Arguably, that's a big potential downside of independence, right? You know, they do have financial services, but can you continue to have Edinburgh as a financial center if your government no longer is in a position to back you up? Uh, because as things stand, Scotland's, um, you know, the, the ratio of Scotland's financial institutions balance sheet to GDP would be at the sort of levels that Ireland or even Iceland had pre-crisis. Even after the crisis? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, you know, that, it's not clear that if you were a, you know, if you're a big financial institution, do you think that that's, a, or, or if, either if you're a government or a financial institution, does that make sense? There are other things. I mean, so for example, even though oil is declining, it's not going to go away anytime soon. And Scotland has done very well in doing the value-added parts of oil, which are internationally marketable. Aberdeen doesn't just service the North Sea. Right. It actually is world-leading in oil field services. So it, you know, it does have, there has, there, Scotland is not a basket case. Um, and I personally think Scotland could perfectly well be a independent, functioning independent country, whether it would be, you know, there's some, if it got policies right. Uh, but there's some potential big risks, and the currency is certainly part of that. Um, a final thing before I open it up to the floor. Um, sort of flipping it around. One of the things about the UK is we are looking at a situation where it is the only large economy in the EU that's outside the Euro area, and is likely to be after a five to 10 year period, at least my colleague Jacob would say, um, the only economy staying out of the euro. Um, is this a stable equilibrium? I mean, leaving aside whatever the U UK populace is getting itself upset about at the moment, is, is this a situation that you think is stable? And if, or is Prime Minister Cameron's statement that he's going to negotiate a new bargain, do you think that's a, a credible thing that can be achieved? Um. I mean, on the first, I think this, the simple answer is we don't know. Uh, it depends what happens in the euro area. I mean, if, if the upshot of the aftermath of this crisis is that uh, the euro area goes to much, much more deeper and closer political as well as economic integration, then there's clearly a big question mark. Um, you know, there are clearly, you, you can clearly imagine ways in which the UK can stay outside the, 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 the euro. Um, you know, it's perfectly possible to have a trade, you know, to have core, you know, common policies across all these areas and still have different currencies. It's, it's perfectly possible. 
whether it's possible in, from an economic perspective or indeed an administrative perspective. Is it possible from a political economy perspective? Is that a stable equilibrium politically? That's not clear. Uh, that's the first uh, on the first one. On the second one, um, you know, I think it is pretty clear that that the prime minister's renegotiation strategy is primarily a strategy about uh, um, a sustainable political equilibrium within the Conservative Party up to and beyond immediately beyond the next election. Uh, how it can be done in practice, I don't think. I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that. Well, you know, he may be well be able to negotiate some things, um, either in terms of changes to the EU as a whole or changes to the UK's relationship, which um, improve matters in terms of how the EU makes decisions or how the UK operates within the EU. There may be some some modest improvements on offer. Um, how that that will satisfy any significant proportion of the that part of the political spectrum which wants us out seems in, including very large sections of the Conservative Party at the moment seems, seems highly improbable. Uh, you know, the big issues for, uh, 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 for the people who want us out are, as you said, around things like labor mobility. Uh, that's not on the table, and, you know, and the Prime Minister knows that's not on the table. Great. So let me open up for questions. Uh, we have a microphone in front, and there's a standing microphone in back. Uh, if, Nicholas, did you want to go? Uh, Nicholas Varon here at the Peterson Institute. Uh, a question of clarification about the, que uh, the financial services industry in uh, Scotland, because it was a big part of the movie. It was, again, uh, in the conversation. My understanding is that a lot of this very high ratio comes from RBS and whatever Bank of Scotland, uh, Scotland's name is in the future. <laughs> and uh, these two uh, companies, well, one of them has a big uh, public sector shareholder who happens to be north of, uh, south of the future border if it comes to this. Uh, it, is it that self-evident that they would remain headquartered in Scotland? Because if they become uh, UK banks, which they are to a large extent already, um, the, then the ratio of financial services, and especially banks that would be in Scotland, would be actually very small. And much of the rest of the financial services industry is asset managers and insurers, which don't carry the same systemic risk. So, isn't there a sort of bias in the whole debate about this? And can you tell you more? Uh, can you tell us more about this? Thank you. Um, uh, yes, that's right. I mean, it, it's perfectly possible that all that ha that that, that uh, uh, you know, the day after a, a referendum, or at least a few months after a referendum, the big. The, the really big institutions, RBS uh, 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 and so on, simply move their headquarters. The question is, uh, and we don't know the answer to that, is what are the knock-on impacts on, you know, uh, um, and, and arguably that doesn't matter. So, you know, and, and no doubt there, and there are people on, on the uh, Scottish, uh, Scottish nationalist side of the case will say, well, it doesn't matter, okay, so 20, so the legal headquarters moves and 50 jobs move, but it doesn't really affect the amount financial services in Edinburgh, uh, but that is untested. Uh, would, in practice, RBS continue to have, uh, because it still has several thousand employees in Scotland, would it, several thousand headquarters employees, would those employees stay there? Um, that's a big deal for Scotland. Um, similarly, uh, you know, okay, so maybe Scottish widows and some of the other life insurers are not systemically risky, but would they not, you know, they all, all these firms already have offices in London, obviously. But many of them do have very substantial HQ operations in, in, in Edinburgh. Would Maybe they would. I mean, it's perfectly credible to argue that they would. Um, but it's, equally, it's not self-evident. Okay. Uh, there's a big risk there, I think, is the, is the point. Cool. Jacob. Uh, Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute. I was wondering if you could, I mean, it seems to me that the whole debate on Scotland is sort of premised on the worst thing that can happen is kind of a Quebec scenario that, you know, it squeaks through 51, 49, um, and, you know, then it goes away. So I was wondering if you could, uh, what if that doesn't materialize? I mean, I, I personally believe you look at the polls, I mean, it suggests that, uh, you know, <clears throat> the UK will stay together, but what if it doesn't? 
uh, uh, you know, if you could spend a little bit of time, uh, you know, describing this wonderful island of instability that you alluded to, you know, what does it look like if uh, Scotland decides, uh, you know, to unilaterally sterlingize, I guess you would call it, and at the same time says, yeah, guess what, we're not going to pay our share of the UK national debt. And, and things like that. What what are the the actual sort of areas of conflict uh, in the in the unstable, messy divorce scenario? Um, I think the the potential uh, uh, the the potential areas of conflict or instability are almost too too numerous to list. Um, so uh, uh, you know um, on. Day one, you know, suppose that, that uh, as you say, I think the, the most likely scenario is, as you say, Quebec. So the polls for staying in, if that's repeated, then uh, that, is, that is indeed the, the, what happened in Quebec pretty much. Uh, except, of course, in Quebec, the polls moved quite a lot over the last few weeks. Um, but that's the most likely. So what happens if it, it does go the other way and it's 51, 49 to leave? Well, Immediately, we have, uh, um, uh, we, first of all, we have a constitutional crisis in the rest of the UK. It's not just Scotland, remember, um, because we're supposed to have an election in 2015. Um, do you have an election in Scotland or not? Um, we d haven't actually even begun, the British political class has not even begun to confront the question of whether, if, they, if Scotland votes for independence, what the UK general election looks like. Uh, so I think there would be chaos. Uh, the Jacob's really the, happy. <laughs> there would be political chaos. Uh, you know, there would be a constitutional crisis there. There would be a political crisis in the Labour Party, which at the moment, uh, uh, whether or not you believe it, is ahead in the polls to, to form the next government in the UK, partly because of its dominance in Scotland. But there would immediately be a political crisis and civil war in the Labour Party. Um, and on top of that, you would immediately, uh, um, so we'd have this political background, as I say, I'm not a political scientist, so how that would pan out, I don't know, except that it would be extremely messy. And at the same time, you'd have these economic arguments, because you, the Scotland would emit, the, the, the main card Scotland has is to threaten to repudiate its debt, or its fair share of the UK's public debt. Um, now, that may appear to be a self-defeating strategy for any country which wants to be taken seriously as an independent responsible economic entity, but it's obviously a big negotiating card. Uh, so, and although the UK could cope with the increase in its debt ratio that will result from having you know, a smaller GDP and the same level of debt, we could presumably, you know, we wouldn't, uh, uh, I don't think financial markets would kill us but there would be a lot of, you know, there, there would certainly be some short-term chaos in that. Um, and uh, so we would immediately, I think, have people staking out very extreme negotiating positions. On the Scottish side, threatening to repudiate the debt. On the UK side, saying, no, we are going to find ways of ensuring that Scotland cannot unilaterally sterlingize. And, and you know, I, Nicholas and others are probably more familiar with the precise mechanics of yeah, uh, uh, of how this would work. But I, uh, I mean, well, you know, if you're, say, um, Bosnia, you can probably get away with unilaterally euro eyes. They, they use the Deutschmark still, I think, or some form or another, and no one really cares. And, you know, but, you know, I assume that, say, Panama can only continue to use no. the US dollar me... because it's tacitly let, tolerated let, by the U.S. No, financial no. system. Bef before Ted does, let me, let me make a comment on this. Yeah. Um, so there, there's two pieces to it. First is, um, Fred Bergson isn't here, but I'll quote one of his favorite pieces of the IMF articles. At least in, in theory, according to the IMF agreement, you cannot unilaterally pick. The country to which you're pegging has to sign off. Now, the U.S. has always chosen since the war to just say it's okay. Yeah. But in this kind of situation, it very easily becomes a credible threat for the UK to deny it. But I think there's a secondary point, which is how much benign neglect versus aggressive neglect yes. the, the central bank chooses to take on. Now, one of the interesting differences, say, when you had German unification or when you have people entering and exiting the euro, they have geographically based representation on the central bank committee. In the UK case, 
it's not geographic. It's not like there's a Reserve Bank of Edinburgh and a Reserve Bank of, of Aberystwyth, and you get rid of that Reserve Bank. But so in such a scenario, I could well imagine a, a Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, you know, trying to find a point very early on when there is a divergence in business cycles or issues between Rump UK and Scotland and making a point of ignoring what's happening in Scotland just to bring it home. I have Lee, I have Anders, and I guess Ted's moving to the mic as well. So why don't we start with Lee? Oh no, Ted's just getting coffee. Um, okay, very good. Lee Price with the FDIC now. Um, your first part of the talk was talking about currency in Scotland, and then you talked about Britain and, and the EU membership, but you didn't talk about EU membership in Scotland. And that, I was wondering, I can understand why the British government is not talking, making that part of their argument because of their own internal issues. But I would think NISA ought to be thinking about that, and, and how much has that been a debate within Scotland? Should it be a part of the debate within Scotland in the next five months? Um, it has become part of the debate. I mean, again, you know, the Scottish nationalists have, have sort of tried to make the argument, well, you know, we sort of automatically get EU membership because we're part of it now and they wouldn't kick us out and everyone would behave like adults. Uh, that seemed, uh, as I was saying in response to, to Jacob, I think it's highly improbable that everybody would be behaving like adults. And uh, again, one of the threats that the, UK, the rest of the UK has in response to, to Scotland threatening to repudiate the debt is to say, well, we're going to veto your accession or your reaccession or whatever you want to call it uh, to, the, to the European Union. Again, there is a general assumption that Scotland would one way or another remain part of the EU should it vote to become independent. But the legality of that is quite complicated. No, no, uh, I, I think, I again, I, I, sorry to come in, but I want to go a little bit further. I mean, we had Almunia here a few months ago, Commissioner Almunia, and yeah. I talked with him on sidebar about this a bit mm -hmm. and others. I mean, it's a little more negative than that <laughs> because, A, it's not just a question of behaving like adults. There are places like, oh, I don't know, Spain, looking at the Basque country in Catalonia that doesn't want to give direct credence to the idea you can have easy exit from one country and not leave the EU. So it's not just the UK in a fit of peak. There are other countries, and Spain's just one of them. But secondly, again, it's not tested, but, but my understanding, and again, Jacob or Nicholas may know this better than I do, or Doug, but my understanding is Scotland would have to go through a lot of the hoops that you normally have to go through for EU membership. It, it's as though ab initio. Now, it would be easier for them than, say, Romania circa 2004. But there, nonetheless, there would be a vetting process, I think. It, it, it should, even if one doesn't care what the Londoners think, it, it, it should not be taken for granted that that would work. Uh, Anders. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very interesting question. But it appears to me that you need to distinguish very clearly between if a currency union breaks up under stress or under no stress. And if we look upon Europe for the last 100 years or so, we have three cases uh, uh, of each kind uh, that I can think of. So the non this would be a non-stress case because there's no crisis uh, uh, apparent. Uh, and uh, it's a political decision rather than an economic uh, crisis decision. And uh, the three cases I have for you then is Norway breaking away from Sweden in 1905, worked perfectly well. The Scandinavian Currency Union worked from 1873 and uh, broke up only in 1914 because Sweden devalued. Uh, so that's the currency, full currency union case. And the second case is uh, Czechoslovakia breaking up in uh, 92. And uh, that was a simple peg between the two countries. Uh, Slovakia quickly stamped its uh, currency uh, so that it became national. And uh, the effect there was that they, uh, Slovakia was forced to devalue by about 10% after a bit more than a month and nothing special happened. Slovakia pursued bad policies and were not punished uh, by it at all. And the third case, as you mentioned, uh, Ireland, when it uh, joined the euro and no problems whatsoever. So these are the three non-stress cases and suggest that there should not be a major uh, problem. While you have uh, three stress cases, 
the collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Habsburg Empire, the collapse of Yugoslavia, which are all disastrous. But that's not the group of uh, incidents that you are discussing. So it appears to me that you are probably a bit too uh, scary uh, in your presentation of it. Your comment? Well, uh, I mean, I, I certainly think that, that some version, I guess, the most relevant, because it's more recent and, and not under, you know, uh, 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 under floating rates rather than the gold standard or equivalent, is, is Czechoslovakia. Um, I think it's perfectly possible um, for Scotland to have its own currency. Um, and as, as you say, I think you know, given Scotland, Scotland's GDP is similar to that of the UK in per capita terms, but it's a bit more volatile, you'd probably see a devaluation of 10% or so and the world will not come to an end. You know, it, it, with, with, uh, in a stable political uh, uh, environment, I think that you know, there's absolutely no reason why that wouldn't happen. Um, at the moment, that's not what the Scottish nationalists are saying is their preferred option. They're saying their preferred option is a full, is, is political separation while maintaining currency union uh, plus a political agreement around the coordination of fiscal policy. And that seems to me to be much less credible. So I'm certainly not saying that, I'm, I'm not saying that Scotland can't be an economically viable uh, 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 on its own or that it couldn't perfectly well have an independent currency. I think what we're saying is that the, uh, the, the, the mechanics and the political economy of a currency union arrangement of the sort that the Scottish nationalists are proposing uh, uh, seems uh, um, quite difficult to implement and that there are significant downsides to the unilateral uh, uh, sterilization, uh, uh, as Adam said. Ted? So, um, so I can correct two bosses at the same time. Hmm. It's not quite true that the IMF articles say that you have to ask permission to pay. It, what they say is you have to take account of the interests in your intervention decisions. You have to take account of the interests of the currency. So you can peg to anybody, and the, it doesn't have to be approved by the United States. And indeed, the countries, so El Salvador and Ecuador, who have dollarized recently, they did it unilaterally. And the currency, I was involved in one and a half of those cases, uh, they basically, you know, they, the currency, there's nothing going on. I mean, they, and, and the United States has been very clear that we don't, as well as with Pope, Pope, uh, Panama for that matter, that we have no responsibility either in any of the responsibility, no discount rate access, no currency access, no financial stability access, which brings me to my question. So I have a technical question. I'm just interested where the, I mean, all this about fair share, so could you expand a little bit on what your fair share what you, what you mean by fair share, since so that's part of the negotiation? In the um, fair share of national debt. Yeah, fair share of national debt. Tech, uh, second question aspect of that, uh, well, uh, you talked about migration. There is a question, it seems to me, of migration with respect to Scotland and the UK. I happen to have a close friend who's married to a Brit who lives in Scotland, uh, an American who lives in Brit. So one question would be how you, what you thought about, well, anyways, what he's thought about migration one way or the other in terms of across the whatever, the Hadrian's Wall, is that what it is? Uh, and uh, my middle name is Malcolm. Uh, and the last one is, how resonant is financial stability in, the, in your little, uh, I don't think, you know, uh, financial stability isn't very resonant in this country, so I would suspect it's not very resonant in Scotland, but maybe, maybe you have a different view on that. No, thank you for the correction, Ted. Um, three questions. Uh, uh, fair shares. Well, uh, in some ways, the, the fact that uh, uh, Scotland's GDP per capita is almost identical to that of the UK, um, sort of through coincidence, it, it used to be, um, makes the, a fair share a little bit easier than it otherwise would have been. Uh, because if you divide by GDP, you get pretty much the same result as if you divide by population. And I think the general assumption um, on both sides is that that is sort of a, the starting point. Um, now, of course, there, there's then a, a question about oil, um, and in particular, uh, 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 where you draw the, the line. It's not quite the, uh, the, the Scottish nationalists have their own equivalent of the uh, Chinese seven-dash line in the, uh, in the Chow, is it the seven-dash line in the South China Sea? 
um, which, uh, which gives them uh, most of the natural resources. So the Scottish nationalists have, a, have an equivalent. Um, so there would be a negotiation about that. That's on the asset side. Um, then, of course, there are a bunch of other, there, there are lots of, of different wrinkles. So, so for example, you know, uh, parastatals like network rail have very large debt. Do you divide that proportionally, or do you say, well, actually, most of the rail, you know, whatever Scotland's share of the rail infrastructure is, what do we do about uh, um, the many embassies we own around the world? There's all sorts of, uh, 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 of issues around that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, um, the sort of basic, what's the percentage share is pretty much dictated by the population and GDP because they're almost identical. Is there any talk about because RBS and HBOS were uh, Scottish. Scottish headquartered that they should get a disproportionate share or a proportionate share, depending on your point of view, of, of, the, of the bad debt? from the banks, or is that not on the table? That hasn't re I mean, you can imagine that coming up in negotiations. It hasn't really yet. Um, uh, second question was around labor mo uh, about labor mobility and immigration between Scotland. This is, an this is another issue which would be probably quite poisonous uh, uh, post-independence, because uh, um, the Scots um, have made clear that they would want to have a more Gener uh, not a, a, a somewhat partly because of the aging and demographic issues that Adam mentioned earlier, that they wouldn't want to have a more liberal immigration policy than the UK. Um, and uh, the counterpoint from the UK government has been, well, if obviously if you're an independent country, you can have your own immigration policy, but we have border controls with the rest of Europe. We're not part of Schengen. Um, so we would have to have border controls with Scotland. Uh, now, I think that is almost unimaginable to most Scottish and English people, the idea that you would have passport controls at, uh, at Hadrian's Wall. Um, but that is the logical consequence of the two positions of the two parties at the moment. Uh, the third question is, is financial stability resonant? Um, well, probably, I mean, it's not the number one issue, but I mean, there are enough people, certainly in Edinburgh and Glasgow, who understand the significance of the financial services industry and the sort of the, 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 the importance of, of institutions like RBS and indeed Scottish widows and so on to, to know that it, it does matter. It's not going to be the number one issue, but equally it's not off the radar entirely. Okay. Bill. Uh, Bill Klein here at the Institute. Uh, I wonder if you could pursue a little bit more this notion of the link to, your, to the euro. <clears throat> I mean, technically, as I understand it, any new uh, member of, the, of their European Union has to sign up to have the euro eventually. So logically that would imply that Scotland on the day it becomes independent would have to sign up to eventually become a member of the euro unless they got some sort of dispensation. But you alluded to the way you think about the uh, UK uh, and, and the European Union as turning on where the euro is going. I mean, The banking union it turns out uh, and the mutualization of banking union, uh, you know, support the safety net is only the 1% that's built up from the banks. So that's not really what matters when you get a crisis. What really matters is whether you get essentially a mutualization, which basically implies political union. So my question is, when you think about this and you think 20 years from now, do you see uh, a really robust Euro area with quasi-political union, uh, mutualization of debt, uh, implicit uh, lender of last resort, you know, going way beyond just this little 1% that the banks have contributed. And if so, doesn't that mean that the exceptionalism of the UK and the, and the pound is basically inconsistent with it? Um. That is a very good question to which I'm not sure I have, uh, uh, I have any more answer uh, 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 you know, that, that, than what was implicit in your question. Uh, that is uh, certainly one possible scenario. Um, and there is certainly a strong argument by saying that, that, you know, that where we are now or where we're likely to be in the next three to five years is not a stable equilibrium in the medium to long run. So when you say 20 years is what you're suggesting, uh, um, uh, 
possible at a more stable equilibrium than, than what, the, what the current dispatch talk arrangements uh, uh, look like? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Uh, so uh, um, that clearly does place a significant question mark over the UK's, uh, uh, the UK's role. Um, you know, but there are, no, there, there are lots of other scenarios that could happen. Um, the whole thing could disintegrate because that sort of political union is unachievable in the Euro area. Equally, uh, you could, the political situation in the UK could change and we could decide that we're actually prepared to sign up to at least some parts of, of that agenda. Um, but I genuinely don't know, I think, is the, is the bottom line. Um, unless there's another question, I, I, will, I will pose sort of one last general economics point. Uh, in the run-up to the Euro, in all the discussions we used to have about this sort of thing, mm -hmm. we always referred to optimal currency area theory. And I used to say, probably mistakenly or, or deludedly, that the UK actually was pretty close to an optimal currency area. It was big enough that its own monetary policy could affect it, but it was small enough that the business cycle throughout most of it ran together and it wasn't that diverse. And, you know, and so first approximation, a good mid-sized country should have its own currency. But, um, that clearly is not part of this debate. That's this debate of Scotland is, is, is being run on political grounds. But for this broader issue in economics of what sort of the right size or right attributes of a currency union, th th does this discussion cause you to think about that any differently than you would have in the past? Uh, I mean, it does. And, and you know, in, in this context, it, it, it's sort of pretty obvious that, that Scotland and the rest of the UK are more of an optimal currency area than greater, greater London and the rest of the UK, right? I mean. Uh, you know, as, as Ted sort of and, and I said, you know, I think you know, Scotland left the UK and had its own currency. You could see a devaluation of you know five to ten percent, just as a sort of volatility or uncertainty premium, but not something we're all shattering. You know, if you try and do the thought experiment of what happens if if the economic London and its economic uh, uh, area and the rest of the UK separated, what do you think the, the, uh, chain, the equilibrium exchange rate would be? Kind of like Germany, Germany and Southern Europe, you know? There might yeah. be an adjustment. 25 or 30 percent. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, so, so I, I mean, I think one thing we have learned is that, uh, um, that, that optimal currency areas are, are sort of nice undergraduate economics exercise, but the, in practice, uh, it's the political economy of your currency area matters as much, or if not more, and, and that indeed is, is what the Scotland debate is about. Great. Thank you all very much for coming out today. We'll look forward to seeing a lot more of you this week, and Jonathan, we'll look forward to seeing a lot more from Nieser on these issues in the years ahead, even if not all in cartoon form. Thank you very much. Thank you.